What is up, everyone, and welcome to episode 21 of The Trainer Scoop, a podcast dedicated to helping individuals passionate about fitness improve in life and lifting. Today's guest, I just got to say, he's a special one. So I think that the best way I can explain my guest today is like most of us, especially the powerlifters that are listening, are familiar with like the Wilkes coefficient, right? So, you know, it factors in like your weight class, your age, it factors in maybe gender, a couple things just to make sure that the, uh, the true display of strength is fair in comparison to other, other lifters. But I'd say if there was a coefficient that, me- that measures in knowledge in exercise physiology, strength, humor, and just like top tier memes, I think I would have a world record holder And that is Davin Greenwell. Davin, thank you so much for taking time to come on the show. I really appreciate it, man. Yeah, I'm glad to be here, man. I appreciate your your, uh, kind words about my demeanor. uh, It's good to know that I could be a world record holder in at least something. (laughs) But Hey, well, like I said, I I think all of those things are very true. And you have a lot to offer just beyond amazing memes as well. So I'm really looking forward to getting into it. And uh, and guys, I think this one will be a treat to listen to for sure. I always like to go into a little bit of the background of how I know my guests. And uh, I can honestly say from my past experience as an intern at NIFS in Indianapolis, Devin was one of the favorite people on this, like this, if you can consider me staff, we were kind of on like the staff of training together. I was the intern, uh, but Davin, he was uh, he was someone that I learned a lot from in that internship, and he's just a cool guy to hang out with as well. So, we're going to talk about some of the the things I learned from Davin while I was at the internship, but also you've had a lot of cool stuff going on since then. So, tap into a little bit of of uh, what's changed for you and what you're currently doing. But a little further on with the background, um, Davin, kind of how did you get on the path that you're currently on in, you know, fitness, transitioning to higher academia and so forth and so on? So that's a, it's always a loaded question, uh, but I'll be as succinct as I can without skipping any relevant details. Um, so basically i started personal training back in 2008 uh, i realized prior to that obviously i wanted to do this i kind of wanted to go this this route um so it was actually co- probably starting back in like gosh, 2005 2004 somewhere around there in high school um i started lifting weights uh i had joined a local gym uh and uh saw the guy who ran the gym is actually a bodybuilder like a a national level, very competitive bodybuilder. And I thought to myself, you know, that's what I want to look like, right? And I was, it was weird because, you know, I'd grown up watching things like Dragon Ball Z and, uh, you know, various uh, like action movies and stuff as a kid that gives me body dysmorphia at a young age. So, uh, <laughs> the, uh, you know, to see someone who actually like had the physical like structure that, uh, you know, I saw and, and things like Dragon Ball Z, right? Or like, you know, like they told me that it was possible to look that way, right? Um, so I remember seeing him thinking, you know, I want to look like that, but not having the slightest clue to get, you know, like how to get from where I was to there because I was, you know, back in high school, I was kind of like an alternative, uh, you know, kind of scrawny kid. I'm not a super large person. I'm like five foot six, right? If if I'm being generous, so like the uh, you know the, the whole process of like trying to get to that point um, was like there was just this big disconnect. Um, there was a, I guess first and foremost, there was a bit of a, like insecurity in the gym, right? I didn't feel like I fit in or belonged there. Um, I certainly wasn't like an athletic person. Um, I also just didn't really feel like I you know, knew what I was doing going in, which I think is the experience a lot of us have when we first, you know, start working out or end up in a fitness uh, center. And so, you know, naturally, I 
did the most logical thing I could think of at the time, which was ask uh, the guy who ran the gym, you know, how do I do this? Like, how do I, how do I get jacked or whatever term I would have used back in 2004? Um, <clears throat> and uh, he proceeded to, you know, give me a workout plan, which, uh, you know, I think at the time I thought it was more like customized than it was. Um, it was just a kind of a generic, like five day split, you know, chest day, back day, leg day, arms day, abs day or something. I don't know. Um, but it was something, right? Like it gave me kind of these initial like foundation to start working from. Um, <clears throat> and to kind of put things in perspective, uh, you know, this is going to sound kind of dated, but like 2004, even though it doesn't seem that long ago, smartphones weren't really in existence yet uh right that's crazy right because we we're just used to them we're so used to them we've had them all this time um so the ability to just like hop on your phone and look up a youtube video on how to do an upright row um you know it just wasn't something we had uh there also you know wasn't really as as widespread high speed internet or uh you know 3g or 4g or any of that stuff so like the access to information was uh still restricted mostly to you know dial up internet in books mm -hmm. and um so i remember i went to the local library and i checked out this book uh, it was called uh natural bodybuilding with john henson uh was the guy's name and uh, i guess he was a pro natural bodybuilder um really uh really basic book nothing super like i don't know life-changing per se in that book uh but for me at the time as you know uh like 16 year old who had no clue what the hell they were doing. Um, it was kind of, it was, you know, my, my training Bible for a bit. Uh, so I read this book pretty thoroughly, you know, learned these exercises in greater detail as best I could from the, the still images, right? Cause it's, you know, one disadvantage to a book is that it doesn't have uh, animations in it, right? <laughs> so you have to kind of, you know, figure out, you know, how does the guy in picture A get to picture B, you know, and how does, you know, how do you translate that into an actual movement? But uh, that really kind of got me going, got me started. And I ended up doing my first bodybuilding contest, actually, about nine months later. Um, so, again, wasn't an athletic person, had no background or real uh, experience in, in sports. So this was all kind of new to me, but I decided to just kind of dive headfirst into, you know, the competition because I figured it would hold me accountable and kind of force me to really commit. And uh, it did. You know, I ended up doing a contest Actually, it was two of them. I did one uh, one week, and then I think there was another one a week or two later. Mm -hmm. um, and I was really, I was pretty hooked by that point because I really enjoyed the the lifestyle and the structure uh, that you know the bodybuilding provided. Uh, and it just gave me a, I don't know, it gave me a map to follow, I guess, you know, on a on a day to day basis. And uh, continued on through high school, just trying to put on some size and stuff. And I remember I did my first competition. I think I weighed in at the contest at like 160, right? Um, so, you know, again, putting things in perspective, I think I started bodybuilding at about 145, right? So I weighed in uh, about 160, I think, at that first contest. And um, I remember finishing like that competition season and thinking, all right, now I just need to bulk up to 190 and then I can cut down to 180 and look like Frank Zane. <laughs> that was my thought, right? Uh, again, like this is, I think, a pretty common thing that a lot of new bodybuilders go through. It's just this kind of unrealistic expectation. Um, you know, you find some some physique role model, and uh, you think that you know you just do exactly what they do, and you'll you'll get there. Um, so, needless to say, I uh, you know kept trying to bulk up, bulk up, and trying to get bigger, and you know get to that Frank Zane physique, and it didn't really happen. <laughs> you know, especially over the next couple of years. Uh, but uh, I ended up competing again. So that was in my first contest, I think, in 2000. I guess it was 2006, right? Is when I did it. Yeah, so first contest was 2006 and graduated in 07. Um, I didn't compete again until 2009. Yeah, I want to say 2009. Uh, and then, you know, I was in much better condition by that point because I actually had several years under my belt. Um, but uh, it was really kind of like that whole initial like start in bodybuilding that got me interested in fitness. And um, I realized that for me, it made a really big difference in my life and kind of helped me with 
you know, a lot of the things I struggle with at the time, you know, like depression and you know, anxiety and just self-esteem and all those, those other issues that I think a lot of angsty teenagers go through. But I also felt like as someone who, you know, wasn't necessarily like a really uh, like popular or like really, uh, you know, socially adept person in high school, uh, it kind of gave me a, uh, I had more resistance getting into it than someone who would have come from that sort of background, but it also gave me kind of a bridge and made it so that you know, I actually ended up being able to like talk to some of like the high school football players and stuff when I was in high school and they were like, oh cool, you like to bench press too, and we like to bench press, and you know, it's, you know, otherwise we had absolutely nothing in common. Yeah. But you know, it, it did help with like the social um, component of things. Uh, and so that's kind of what got me into the whole uh, personal training side of things because I realized that, you know, it made a big difference for me. And there are a lot of people like me out there who probably wouldn't, you know, wouldn't look at uh, fitness as like a, an approachable thing. But if they knew that there were more people like them who were into fitness, maybe that would, you know, inspire them or encourage them or make them feel more comfortable with it. Mm -hmm. and so that's kind of where I decided to go into that. And so I started personal training in 2008. I remember uh, I got really into uh, the muscular development uh, magazines. I don't know if you've ever read any of those or if they even still make them. Um, I think they changed to RX Muscle is the website or something that they run now. But I really liked their magazines. I felt like they were more, uh, you know, raw. They had more, um, I don't know, just science and like detail and stuff in them. So I started reading a bunch of those, and uh, there was a guy uh, named uh, Dave Palumbo, um, really weird-looking dude. Um, he's just got a honestly a very grotesque physique, but uh, I just I just liked his uh, his kind of forwardness about his uh, training style and all that stuff. So um, I remember he was advertising a uh, personal training certification course that he had put together, and again. I had no clue what was considered credible or viable at the time, but I was like, Hey, he's a bodybuilder. You know, he seems to know his stuff. Um, I'll, I'll do his personal training certification course. And uh, honestly, I think I still got my certificate sitting somewhere in like a folder over on this desk here. But uh, it was one of those things, you know, you, you pay the, the fee, they send you a little PDF book. Uh, you review the book, you take the, the, the test online you know open book basically if you want to because there's no one watching <laughs> and um yeah so uh i did that it was like a 100 bucks or something which to me was a lot of money at the time but it was still cheaper than trying to do like a, an ac certification and uh i didn't know what acsm or an sca were back then uh so yeah i knocked it out got my certification started personal training and uh Honestly, had no idea what I was doing for you know, a couple of years, but got some decent results with a couple of clients and, uh, you know, did it kind of part-time while working other part-time jobs because uh, from a small town, you know, it's, it's hard to make like a, a career and make a living as a personal trainer. But after a few years of that, I realized like, okay, I can either commit to this full-time and like go back to school for it, or I can, uh, you know, just do something completely different and so one of the things I've been kind of uh, juggling was whether or not I wanted to go into like a like a nursing program or or like a paramedic program because I'd actually finished an EMT certification course uh, after high school and worked for a few years as an EMT and uh, the job was real stressful but it also kind of gave me some insight into like what happens when you don't take care of your body Right, because a lot of the people that we uh, dealt with or transported were, you know, basically uh, end stage or end of end of their life stage patients who were like, you know, going to dialysis or you know, to and from doctor's appointments from like uh, you know, nursing homes or extended care facilities, and uh, it was it was just crazy to me how some of these people like their lives could have ended up so much differently if they had just had like you know, proper like instruction and exercise. And uh, or you know, had some sort of opportunity or exposure to it, um, because a lot of these people, you know, again, were just they were dealing with the outcomes of leading a sedentary, unhealthy life, you know. And um, so that's when I decided, okay, I don't want to be in medicine anymore because I kind of hate this job. Um, <laughs> it's uh, it's very stressful, and um, 
I want to really pursue, you know, personal training and I'm doing my clients a disservice by not getting further educated. Um, so yeah, that's why I enrolled uh, in college. I think I kind of enrolled uh, part-time again when I was like 22. So waited a few years. Um, but it, uh, it gave me some insight and kind of really solidified that that's what I wanted to do. Um, I went part-time for about two years before I transitioned to full-time and uh, then moved to Indianapolis to uh, actually be closer to school because driving you know, an hour and a half each way to school is not fun. Yeah, it was not fun. <laughs> so uh, yeah, got that all knocked out. I finished my undergrad back in, uh, was it? we're in 2020 now. So I guess I finished that in 2017. Uh, started my master's program. I think I had like six months of uh, a break there where I was uh, actually getting into some research and stuff. Um, before I started the master's program and um, then just finished my master's and started my PhD uh, this semester. So it's the first semester of my PhD program. And kind of a lot of things have uh, occurred through that time frame. But uh, I think the biggest thing, man, like I always tell people, education is probably the single most important decision I've ever made in my life because uh, things could have gone very differently for me um, had I not gone that route. And I feel like despite the, you know, uh, ridiculous cost of going to school, right? Because student loans are no fun. Um, I think even if I don't end up making the money back, like from a from a, like a financial standpoint, just the investment in my uh, in my development, like self development, has been worth every penny. Although I still think college should be cheaper. <laughs> you know what I mean? But uh, yeah, so like going through that whole process, um, you know, I learned in my Based on my undergrad, I learned that commercial fitness is not what it seems to be, right? Which is, I'm sure a similar experience that you've had, David, just kind of going through undergrad. Like you get into it and you, you think, oh yeah, exercise science and take this, these branching amino acids and you'll get swole with science. Ah, and then uh, you finish, yeah, you, you finish and you're like, wow, there's a lot of stuff that I thought was, you know, truth that isn't. And a lot of people are being, you know, duped into buying into this. And uh, that was kind of my, my transformation from undergrad to, um, you know, starting graduate school. Um, and so it kind of gives you this different perspective on uh, kind of the industry. But then going through a master's program, um, you know, I thought I knew a lot about science and a lot about like research upon finishing my undergrad. But going through just the master's program, I realized how much like I didn't know then, right? And so starting this PhD, and it's obviously gonna be uh, more extensive than the master's program. I'm, I'm really curious to see how I come out on the other end of that, because um, I wholly expect it to kind of change my perspective again. But yeah, it's kind of you know, drawn me away from uh, commercial fitness the longer I've been involved with it, just because I realized that commercial fitness isn't changing. The only way to really make money in commercial fitness and be successful is to uh, basically sell your soul and lie to people and cheat and steal. And that's just not something that I personally want to do, uh, which is why, you know, working at a place like NIFS was kind of cool. Um, that wasn't like that, uh, the, the, the whole like pressure to try and, you know, sell someone some product that they don't need or convince them that there's something wrong with them that you can fix. Um, and commercial fitness is completely centered around that idea. And that's just, for me, not something I want to be a part of long term. Because I'm just not, I don't know, I'm not the social butterfly that maybe a lot of people in the industry are personally. And I'm also just not cool with, uh, you know, selling my soul or selling my values uh, to make a buck, right? Which uh, is why academia is more interesting to me. And I'm hoping too that like, down the line as an academic, I can hopefully influence, you know, the new, you know, upcoming generations of, you know, new students going through exercise science programs and things like that and influence them to be better trainers because, you know, I've done it. I know what the industry needs and I know kind of what my experience has been in the industry and I uh, hope that I can help people improve that industry or give it some more credibility because it's, you know, if you, if you talk to someone about exercise science, um, like it's not carried and someone doesn't look at exercise science or kinesiology with the same weight that they look at medicine, right? Or even physical therapy. And really it needs to be on that same 
same uh, like playing field, but it's until there's more uh, accountability for professionalism in our field, I don't think we're going to see people taking exercise or exercise um, like uh, specialists or trainers or anything like that. I mean, they're just never going to be taking us seriously. Yeah. But it's, yeah, I mean, it's just part because it's like the Wild West, man. Like <laughs> anyone can do anyone can do anything, but there's yeah. no, at least in the U.S., there are no uh, legal requirements to being a trainer. Like everyone listening to this podcast right now, all I have to do is say you're a trainer. And technically that's enough to make you a trainer. Yeah. You know, I don't even have to do that, right? Like it's, <laughs> you could just be a trainer, look at a dog and like, make a connection with that soul and be like, I commit to being a trainer and that makes you a trainer. Like it literally anything. So just kind of understanding that that's like the, that's the state of this, this commercial fitness industry. Um, And people are just being sold a bunch of BS products in the form of people or supplements or whatever. And Mm -hmm. I just kind of want to, I want to see that change. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's a really loaded question. Like I said, and let's, me trying to be kind of uh, short with it. So. Right. Well, I will say, I think you've already made an impact. Definitely, probably more than you think too. Um, you know, there's there's a couple of things that stick with me that I learned from you, and I'm sure that's the case from some of your students as well. But uh, I want to I want to hit on some of the other things you talked about. Uh, like that first program you got, it reminded me so much of the first like actual structured program I followed was on the back of a body fortress, which was the Walmart. Oh yeah. (laughs) That was the first routine I ever, and it was like a bro split type deal, but I just felt so like special, like, cause I was following a plan. I was like, no one else that I know does this. I'm going to meticulously track everything. I'm about to get jacked. (laughs) Right. Right. You feel like you just found the secret, right? Which is interesting. If you ever look at like um, next time you're at the, the grocery store and you're in like the, the checkout line, look at the magazines, right? A lot of those magazines, especially the ones that are targeted towards women, it's it's honestly terrible the way we market things towards women. But uh, a lot of those are like, you know, so-and-so's secret to melting tummy fat or so-and-so, uh, you know, has a special routine uh, you know, they haven't told you to, to getting shredded in just six weeks. And like, <laughs> dude, so much of the stuff, it's like everyone has a secret, right? And you don't have the secret. That's what the, everything's always trying to sell you. And it's been that way since like day one. So either no one has a secret yeah. or everyone has a different secret that doesn't work. Right? Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's just like, That's so funny. I've never thought of it that so, way. Right, but I think we're kind of like uh, programmed to think that there's something that we're missing because, you know, most of us, if we've, especially like, you know, we've been kind of fortunate that we've like really fallen into fitness and it's been a huge part of our lives. But for the average person, you know, who maybe has, you know, struggled with their weight or struggled with, uh, you know, like body image issues or, or whatever, they haven't necessarily had success um, you know, with fitness in a, in a way that's you know, brought them contentment. Mm-hmm. And um, I think a lot of those people, they just, they, they fail and fail and fail again. And they just feel like, you know, the people that are succeeding know something that they don't, or that, that there's something that they're just not getting or not understanding. And um, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's really frustrating the way it gets marketed because like, I mean, I always tell people like the secret is just being consistent and doing something that you enjoy uh, consistently. Like if you can do it consistently with enough intensity or enough effort, I mean, pretty much any sort of fitness approach is going to work. I don't care if it's P90X or if it's CrossFit or uh, like, (laughs) right. Uh, Or, you know, whatever, like powerlifting, bodybuilding, like, any of those things will be successful over the long term if you're consistent with it and you, you know, you're passionate about it. But the problem I think people run into is that they're, they're convinced that what works is the thing that they haven't tried yet. And uh, 
typically it's the thing that they don't like to do that works, right? So they think that they need to do something that they hate, um, you know, and it's going to get them to some point that they want to be. And ultimately, that's usually not really, you know, what leads to long-term adherence. You may be able to, like, maybe, like, commit to, like, a six-week, like, you know, I don't know, juice cleanse and change your life program, whatever that they're selling on Facebook marketplace groups or whatever. But doing that may be really, really unpleasant, right? You may be starving yourself essentially for like six weeks. You may be, you know, working out seven days a week because like for whatever reason you were able to find six weeks of your life that you could just commit to like, you know, two hour long workouts seven days a week. And uh, which seems to be kind of what happens in January every year for people. But, um, you know, there's that, that overzealous like effort in something that you hate or something that's really unpleasant and it creates this kind of negative association, right? Um, Long term, you end up getting burnt out if you don't adhere and that whole consistency uh, component goes away. So you may see great results for, you know, a month, but after that month's over, you just don't do it anymore because it's not sustainable. Um, again, I think it's one of the, one of the things that's so like interesting about like commercial fitness is like, you know, people are very results oriented. People want things fast. You know, they want, they want to lose weight and they wanted to lose it three years ago or five years ago, whatever. And, uh, and so to wait another, like to, to have someone come to you and say like, okay, I want to lose 20 pounds by, you know, so-and-so's wedding that's in eight weeks. And for you to then tell them, well, you could do that. However, you should really be setting more of like a, a six month or you know two year goal. Like yeah. this isn't something that you want to try and hit in six weeks uh, or eight weeks. And they just don't want to hear that because there's going to be someone else who's going to tell them that they can. Yeah. Right? And someone else is going to sell them, you know, what they want to hear. And ultimately they're going to try it for, they might stick to it for eight weeks and lose that 20 pounds, but after that time period is over, it's not sustainable and they end up reverting or having more, more damage done than, you know, good that was done. You know what I mean? That's a, yeah. So. Yeah. I, I actually had a, a very similar occurrence and uh, we do like orientation process similar to the way NIFS did it. And uh, I had that exact scenario with the wedding and I was like, yeah, that's a, that's a very aggressive goal. I like, I respect your, your uh, tenacity toward that, but it might be a little bit more detrimental to your health than anything. And like, you could just see a shutdown. I was like, well, I'm not going to get them as a client, but <laughs> I mean, right. So, I, you know, just one thing that you might do from like a strategy standpoint is uh, I've found that trying to reframe a goal for, for people like that is effective sometimes. Mm-hmm. Um, so rather than like saying, okay, you know, you tell me you want to lose 20 pounds, but what if I tell you that, you know, in that eight weeks time, you can make your, you know, your dress fit better or your pants fit better, or you can, you can lose like three inches off your belt, right? Mm-hmm. Like, why don't we focus on that instead of that scale weight? Yeah. Right? Like things like that, I think can like, just, just taking people away from like that, that numbers game of the scale, I think is a really good starting point because again, so many people they come with these goals and they don't really know what it means when they say they want to lose 20 pounds. They just think, you know, well, I was 20 pounds lighter in high school or whatever. And I looked right. good then, but they don't know what that functionally means. Right. So, but yeah, that's, that's one way I will have approached that in the past. that seems to be met with a little less rejection or a little less, uh, you know, dismissal, but that's a very, very good piece of advice. I think, you know, like you said, I think there are many people out there that aren't comfortable with sacrificing their values just to make mm-hmm. a dollar. Like I, I honestly right. think from, you know, talking to my peers, granted, when you come from a setting of academia, I think people are more like-minded, whereas, you know, outside of academia, people are more capitalist uh, minded maybe. But I feel like there is a, a decent crew of people that want to hold those values true. They want to teach people how to do things correctly. And yeah, like doing small things to, to reframe people's ideas and then teaching them over time, that can be a great way to mm-hmm. approach that. 
Yeah, I think honestly, as trainers, like our main goal is really, uh, we, we're teachers, right? We're, we're educators for the people that come to us for help uh, because our goal should basically be to get them to a point where they feel like they have enough self-efficacy or understanding that they can do this on their own, mm -hmm. right? Um, and, you know, they may never get to that point or they may never decide that they want to work without a trainer, which is fine. But, you know, the way I've always approached it is like, you know, if I just died tomorrow or something randomly, I would hope that my clients were able to continue on their own and like maintain their fitness, right? Mm -hmm. I've taught them enough to be able to do that. Um, so the, the again, it's just about building up people, not about like just, you know, hitting these, these superficial goals. I think it's about making people as a whole better, um, yeah. which is, again, not necessarily what, what commercial fitness tries to do which again is why i don't particularly take the commercial fitness as much anymore mm -hmm. um you know honestly the bodybuilding industry like i spent so much time in that and it's you know it's, it's a very niche thing but it's no better honestly the uh they're just they're just a flashier version of commercial fitness is all it is yeah. it's basically commercial fitness on steroids for you know lack of a better term uh but uh and it's, it's the same with any sort of like real like sport or niche sport like that. But the, at, at the end of the day, like our job as, as professionals should not be to like try to, you know, make a buck off of someone's misfortune or make a buck off someone's like, uh, you know, unhappiness with himself. It should be really just to try and improve, I think, people in general. Yeah. Like, that's, yeah. a, that's a whole other topic for discussion, honestly. Right, right. One thing that you said earlier that definitely resonated with me, um, not that I come from exactly the same background, but, you know, finding that sense of confidence within yourself and being able to relate to other people through lifting was also a, a huge thing for me. Um, I wasn't, you probably know that about me just from, from uh, knowing me in, in my internship and everything, but I was never like the most introverted but I was definitely not the most athletic. And, uh, you know, when I started lifting weights, I found like I was, you know, even working out in our school weight room, I made so many, so many more friends uh, among the athletes. And I think that's why almost my favorite demographic to work with are like guys that are in their late teens that, you know, kind of similar, uh, they might not have the most confidence. They've never really been exposed to proper training and just seeing like, the transformation in their confidence because they've won stuck to the plan, achieved the goals, but you can see that they're just overall perception of themselves improves slowly as well. I really think that's, that's cool. Uh, just as a trainer, you know, for sure. Absolutely too. Because like, you know, like guys like us in general, like we may not have bad genetics, right. But we may not have the best genetics in the world. Right. Uh, so we kind of get in these environments, uh, especially get like surrounded by like say bodybuilding or uh, you know, powerlifting or whatever your sport is like, or even if you're just like on the high school football team and you're not the biggest, strongest athlete there, like there's only something in your head kind of saying, well, why am I not better? You know, why am I, what am I doing wrong? Why do I need to train harder? Should I eat harder? Should I take, you know, some more, some more Jack 3D or whatever, like supplement. Yeah. I don't know what pre-workout people are taking nowadays, but uh, like there's there's that like question of like what's wrong with me. But ultimately, I think it's those people in those positions that tend to, you know, learn the most because they have to, right? If you're just naturally genetically gifted and just super successful, you know, at whatever you do, I don't think there's as much uh, learning that has to go into the process. You just you know, you look at a dumbbell and you get bigger, right? And that's just, well, that's how it works, right? You just look at the dumbbells and you grow. <laughs> but, uh, right. So, yeah, I think that's big, too, because uh, I think education is like kind of that, that middle ground, right? That's where, like, we, like, kind of bridge that gap and, like, help people develop that self-efficacy. So, yeah. Definitely. I just had a question come to mind on something that you said earlier. So, you were saying, like, bodybuilding has kind of become like a glorified example of commercial fitness. And uh, going back to, to what you said originally as well about the, 
the change in times, you know, you're not, you're not that much older than me, but just the crazy increase of access to knowledge that we've had, especially for me, because I had YouTube um, coming up. I've also seen, you know, fitness become slowly more mainstream. And I was just wondering your thoughts on that. Like, it seems like now, like I, I've seen and no hate to them, but like 16, 17 year old NPC model girls. And I was just like, what the hell? Like that would never have happened when I was in high school. So what are your yeah. thoughts? Oh man. Uh, <laughs> huge, huge can of there actually. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, all right, I'll, I'll put this on record. I think the advent of bikini into the sport of bodybuilding, uh, which happened, I think, in 2006, I think that's what destroyed bodybuilding as a sport. Mm -hmm. um, and I say that subjectively because the sport is doing better now than it ever has. But I think a lot of diehard bodybuilders would agree with me that the sport is not what it used to be. Um, it was very much a counter like kind of counterculture, like, uh, you know, niche sport, niche thing that like, you know, you, you didn't really know a lot of people that were into it. Um, it was, it was different, right? And there was also like not social media kind of feeling it yet back then. But uh, you know, I think I was like the last generation of bodybuilders that were getting into this before social media was like part of it. And uh, <clears throat> so bikini kind of started back in 06, uh, men's physique started back in 07. Um, and both of those, the way I look at it is, again, no hate to those competitors in particular. Um, it's it is what it is, but like it kind of lowered the bar for competing in physique sports. Mm -hmm. um, the premise being that, uh, you know, men's physique, uh, you know, you could you go out in board shorts, um, not be as big, not be as, as lean or as jacked or whatever, um, and still be competitive. And then uh, bikini, kind of same concept, uh, you know, not being as, as lean or as muscular, uh, being more, um, you know, for lack of a better term, sexualized, uh, kind of helped to, I think, sell that too, because I think a lot of women were put off by the sport simply because they didn't want to become so, like, you know, masculinized, right? Or so, uh, you know, uh, non-feminine looking and right. so i think bikini kind of opened that but i do remember like back when i was getting into bodybuilding in high school like it was it was it was almost like approached as if there was like some level of like i don't know like homo eroticism or something in like a bunch of dudes and, and posing trunks you know oiled up and flexing on a stage uh like that's kind of how people saw it back then and obviously society's become more progressive since then and i think um even if that were the case like it would be more well accepted but i think really by adding this whole different uh facet where you know there are uh women who are being sexualized right uh, in this case bikini competitors um it allowed the sport to become uh more open to the mainstream because now uh you know, it wasn't like men weren't being frowned upon for like being at these events or for like going to watch a bodybuilding contest because, you know, oh, now there are hot chicks there, bro. You can go watch <laughs> chicks in bikinis. It's not just like going to look at a bunch of muscled up dudes, right? Uh, so I think that that from like a social perspective really changed the way people looked at bodybuilding, at least in the mainstream. Um, I don't think that bodybuilders in particular were ever like, sexualizing what they were doing necessarily and i don't think that you know even a lot of like people nowadays and like the you know the, the bikini uh sports or the you know, men's physique necessarily look at it that way uh i'm sure there are plenty that do but you know i don't think that a lot of them necessarily do look at it that way but again looking at it from like this this outside uh onlooker uh, perspective i think that it's it's perceived differently now than it was then because of that it's kind of made it just more i guess approachable right it's not as it's not as off-putting to people mm -hmm. um but again it also lowered the bar for competing right so before to be a successful bodybuilder i mean you have to be someone who at least like 
knew your your uh, gym science well enough to like get jacked and lean and all that stuff. So you knew, you know, you gotta eat your chicken and broccoli every three hours and you know, you gotta do 10 sets of 12 for hypertrophy on bench press or whatever. Like you knew those things to be a max and you knew those things to be true. And those are things that the, the normal population didn't know or do or adhere to. Um, and so like bodybuilders really had this like kind of this higher level of commitment to the sport um, than people coming in at that lower entry point, if that makes sense. It's like you didn't have to be as meticulous about things to be uh, viable in competition. Mm-hmm. And I've heard a lot of people say that too in the past that like, well, you know, I don't think I'm big enough for bodybuilding, so I'm going to do physique, right? Or, you know, I don't think I'm, uh, you know, at that level yet. And so, you know, it's almost like a, it's like bodybuilding light, right? It's like the, the easy intro version. Um, which is, you know, not to say there aren't fantastic competitors, like especially at the professional level. Like you look at some of these professional, uh, like physique athletes and professional bikini athletes, and they're fantastic, like competitors, fantastic athletes. Um, but from like the general populace thing, I, by lowering kind of that bar, it's like if we uh, you know change the the entry standards for I don't know, doctors, right? It's like, well, you know. We used to require you to have an MD, but now we're gonna let you in with a bachelor's degree. Yeah, right? <laughs> that's a funny one. You might still end up, right? I mean, you might still end up with some decent bachelor's degree doctors. I mean, it's not completely out of the question. Uh, it's just not likely, right? And uh, that's kind of what's happened with like the sport of bodybuilding is it's kind of opened this uh, floodgate for like a lower threshold of like knowledge or, or devotion. And that's caused kind of this influx into the field of a bunch of people who just aren't as committed or aren't as like uh, well versed on these things. And it's it's changed the the sport pretty dramatically because at the same time uh, social media really kind of took off, and so Facebook was starting to really gain some momentum back then. And uh, I think Instagram really kind of started probably in like oh seven oh eight somewhere around there and really took off around 09 or 2010 as smartphones started to be more viable. Um, mm-hmm. I still remember my first smartphone. It was, oh, it was so painful to use, man. Like it was just slow and laggy and like everything was wrong with it. I took <laughs> it back to the to the, the store like a week later. And I was like, look, you have to give me something else. Otherwise I'm canceling my service. But <laughs> like, so again, that's like just about 10 years ago, right? Uh, so this has all happened very rapidly and things have changed so much and in part because social media has like blown up as much as it has it's given people this uh, kind of avenue to market themselves and you know we think about like bodybuilding as kind of this counterculture thing um, the average person doesn't look at a bodybuilder and think oh man that looks good I want to look like that but they might look at like a physique competitor and think oh yeah that guy's in good shape. I want to look like him. Or, you know, you might see a bikini competitor as as a woman and think, oh, she's in awesome shape. She's really thin. She's really, you know, she's got great legs. I want to look like that. Whereas like before, uh, again, like if if that weren't a uh, a division of bodybuilding, you might see the females associated with bodybuilding and think, I don't want to look like that. Right. Yeah. So by kind of lowering the bar, it's also opened up uh this kind of more like acceptable image for like the, the bodybuilding community which again is you know good in some respects but it's also uh kind of brought more like public interest and uh so i think that's what's really kind of caused the sport to blow up and grow as much as it has is because now people can relate with it a bit better it's not as uh niche or countercultured as it used to be um and it's just it's changed the sport dramatically i remember like the the scope and the size of the contests that uh, I was going to and competing in back in like the mid two thousands. I mean, I, I want to say there were probably like fifty or sixty people total at my first bodybuilding contest, like total like competing, um, and that might be pushing it honestly. Um, whereas like now, like you look at some of the the bigger like local contests, the one they held down in Louisville, Kentucky, the, uh, Kentucky Derby. It's a two-day event. There are so many competitors. It starts at like, like the the, the the night show or whatever starts at like four or five o'clock in the afternoon, 
and goes till two in the morning. Like it's huge. There are hundreds and hundreds and the majority of them aren't bodybuilders. Like the size of the bodybuilders and the bodybuilding division specifically hasn't really changed much. Mm -hmm. um, if anything, they may have gotten smaller. So you're not getting uh, a larger influx of like just pure bodybuilders competing. Um, you're just getting hundreds, like literally hundreds of bikini competitors and men's physique competitors like up there going because it's, there's, there's, it's easier to walk into, you know what I mean? Yeah. So more people are, more people are seeing people do it, more people are knowing people that do it, and more people are doing it themselves. The, the, the real downside, the big thing that, again, I don't care so much about the sport itself anymore, but like the real downside I see is having on fitness or uh, commercial fitness is that it's creating this kind of semblance or feeling of like knowledge or self-efficacy in individuals uh, that ne don't necessarily have uh, a, enough knowledge or a threshold of knowledge to be qualified to train other people. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if you go, if you go do one of these contests and you, know, you get third place out of 20, 20 people in your, your division, um, now you feel like you know a lot because, you know, you're third in the state, right, at this thing. Um, and so now they're fitness experts, right? And maybe they've been doing it for a year um, or maybe that they, they, they went and they got first place, but they just have fantastic genetics and, you know, they're using a ton of steroids or whatever, like, these are the people that like go on to become trainers a lot of times mm -hmm. and you know their their only credentials or qualifications are that you know well i placed you know i was a nationally qualified bikini competitor or as if that means something right or like as if i was a you know even in some cases like professional level bodybuilders you know they're going on saying that that's some sort of qualification for like training and uh, i would wager that most most people graduating with under, undergraduate degrees in kinesiology or exercise science probably know more than most professional level bodybuilder, bikini competitors, et cetera. You know, and that's, um, again, it's where it's just kind of dangerous because it kind of brings all of these people into the uh, our field of exercise science and makes them, uh, puts them in the public eye and public perspective. And these are the people that are getting the attention and getting noticed because ultimately when someone goes to look for a trainer, they're going to look for the person that looks like they know what they're doing. They're not going to look for the person with the, the best degree, right? That's not the thing that they're typically looking for, especially on Instagram. They're not like, they're, they're going to be like, oh yeah, it's a cool looking bachelor's degree. I'm going to check that person out. You know, you look at the person who's bench pressing 500 pounds or the, the girl who's got the biggest booty popping, you know, those are the things that are like drawing people's attention and their clicks. What's so that? yeah, that's, again, that's, that's, huge can of worms, um, probably really unpopular opinion to say that, um, again, nothing, I don't, it's, it's not that I hate those people or bikini competitors or men's physique competitors or anything in particular. It's just, that's just kind of how it changed the sport and how it's affected commercial fitness as a whole. And it's something I feel is not great personally, but most definitely yeah, it is what it is. Yeah. So. Yeah. And that's, and that's the beauty of, change right like right it we might not always love it and it might not always be for the best but i feel like over time things come full circle and i'll be interested right. to see how it changes and evolves in the future absolutely yeah i mean it's it's always interesting if, if nothing else you know it's always interesting yeah, yeah. so kind of a, a similar follow-up question and this might seem a little hypocritical for both of us because mm -hmm. we've both done online coaching. I've had mm -hmm. successful online coaches on this show that make a crazy amount of money. Um, but how do you feel about this reliance for many competitors, whether it be powerlifting, um, you know, the bikini physique, bodybuilding, that it seems like so many people uh, are utilizing coaches. What do you see? How do you see that? impacting people and fitness culture as a whole? It's a great question. Um, you know, again, I do some online coaching myself. Uh, so I guess I can talk about this from both the perspective of, uh, you know, someone who's jaded by the industry and someone who's in the industry. Right? Um, 
The uh, I think it's probably by and large a good thing because I think having some instruction is probably better than no instruction in, in a lot of cases. Um, having said that, however, the, the quality of the instruction can really be uh, questionable in some cases. Uh, just because someone has a you know particular achievement that they've you know gotten to in a sport doesn't necessarily make them a, a qualified coach for that sport. Um, I, uh, there's a guy I follow um, on YouTube, and uh, actually I just saw he released a bunch of new videos over quarantine. I'm really excited to watch those. Uh, but his name's Tom Purvis. He uh, made a video um, one time called "What Should a Personal Trainer Look Like." Uh, and you know, I advise anyone who's listening to this to check that video out. Uh, it's, it's a really cool video. But uh, he talks about uh, Muhammad Ali's coach, right? So Muhammad Ali is, you know, arguably one of the best boxers that's ever existed, right? Uh, very, very successful, very effective uh, boxer. But when you look at him, you can see him and think, okay, yeah, he, he looks like a boxer. He looks like a good boxer. But his coach, right, the guy who coached Muhammad Ali and helped him become the best boxer, just kind of, I want to say he was just kind of like a short, kind of chubby older dude. I don't know the guy's name. Some of you guys might know him, but um, <clears throat> he certainly didn't look like a world-renowned boxer, right? And he, I don't think he particularly was a world-renowned boxer. He was just a really good coach. Um, he was able to help Muhammad Ali, you know, unlock his potential and become the, the best the boxer you could be. Uh, so when we see these these people kind of gravitating towards coaches, a lot of times we're they're going towards people that kind of meet a certain image or a certain uh, you know, objective that they, they want to. So you might find someone who's got like, you know, the best deadlift in Indiana or whatever, and uh, think, okay, well, you know, this person got the best deadlift in Indiana. I'm going to hire them to coach me on deadlift uh, because clearly they know what they're doing um and you know they could they might know but uh, a lot of times you know that person has a coach right and that person's coach has a coach right and so there's like this endless chain of coaches and uh it's like where's the knowledge really coming from sometimes you end up getting a coach who's just getting programs from their coach and then just charging you for those programs of getting from their coach uh, and so it's regurgitating. I'm not kidding, man. That happens. Like people just regurgitate programs that they pay for, for from someone else to their clients. They're, they're, uh, it's, it's weird. But um, the uh, so I think that having a coach can be a great thing. I think that you know having someone who's successful or effective at coaching um, whatever you're interested in, they don't even necessarily have to be someone who's degreed or certified necessarily. Uh, I know a lot of people who don't have degrees in this field or who have degrees in other areas who are you know, way more technically uh, proficient at, let's say, like a deadlift or a squat pattern than I am, right? And so while I may know, you know cognitively what a deadlift or a squat should look like or feel like biomechanically, if there's someone else out there who's like just an expert on that specific movement because, you know, maybe they just really been interested in getting good at it and i can pay them to watch my my squatter my deadlift and give me some feedback and by all means like if it helps me improve mine i think that that's valuable um now personally i would feel more comfortable if i found someone like that who did have a degree and had qualifications simply because i you know, i've been through the process i know kind of like what you learn through that that you know, process of education um and it's, it's pretty valuable but uh, I think, you know, some of the people that come to mind, uh, one of the people that comes to mind is like Mark Ripito. He's, uh, I think he's got like a bachelor's degree in like geology or something or like some sort of like geological sciences. Obviously not even remotely related to, uh, you know, exercise science. But he's a very effective strength coach, right? And he seems to know those things pretty well. I mean, there's a lot you can learn outside of academia if you apply yourself and put the effort in. I mean... I think it was Albert Camus, one of my favorite philosophers, who said, it seems that everything I know about myself, I have learned from books, right? Um, and so like our entire like education, our entire knowledge that we have, even as you know, people with degrees, 
pretty much everything we learned, we learned from someone else who wrote down, right? Mm -hmm. And so we, we learn these, these things from the things we read or the people that lecture to us. And those things are obviously accessible, especially with today's technology. And those things are very accessible outside of an academic setting. Um, so you can certainly learn those things on your own if you're willing to put the time and the effort in. Um, the thing I like about the, uh, the academic process is that you typically have some agreements on, you know, uh, several fronts from a lot of different professionals on what a complete education or knowledge base in this area should look like. And they all kind of put together this plan of study. And a lot of those things you learn are kind of complementary. But again, you can learn all that stuff on your own in your own time if you're so inclined to do so. So that's where like, you can find good coaches out there that aren't necessarily qualified or degreed or whatever. Um, I think the biggest thing is just making sure that like your coach is not just someone you're just paying uh, just because they've got the name or the, you know, the face or the, the booty or whatever. It's someone who's actually uh, has like a history of success with their, their uh, clients. And it's also hopefully ideally not someone who's like trying to just like, make a buck off of you by selling you some like, I don't know, probiotics and, you know, get ripped quick uh, water or whatever, like, which ultimately just ends up being bogus. But yeah, if your coach is trying to sell you a bunch of supplements, you should probably drop your coach. If your coach is telling you where to buy supplements from that are the cheapest place to get them, probably a good coach. There you go. That's, that's my two cents. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, it's a very, Interesting like, to think maybe even 10, 15 years ago that this would be a type of viable career that it is. You've probably got some raised eyebrows, but like you said, there, there are things that qualify someone to be a great coach and you just have to understand over time what those are. Um, right. Yeah. And, and with that being said, I kind of want to, shift back over to um, some of the academia type stuff. So, sure. so Davin, you're on your way to this PhD. Um, what is one area that you'd like to really delve deep into and, and get to that expert level of knowledge? Yeah. Um, so basically my PhD is in exercise science, but the focus is on motor control. Um, so the research that we're doing is uh, specifically looking at kind of uh, like cortical control of uh, effectively like force output, strength, uh, those sorts of things, movement. Um, and we're trying to um, maybe do some research on kind of some of the, the aspects of uh, like, trying to think of a way to say this that makes sense. Some of the, the aspects of your brain that are involved in uh, either facilitating or inhibiting uh, kind of maximal voluntary contractions. Mm -hmm. um, so when you think about like the max, one rep max squat effort or something, the initial uh, drive to move and lift that bar up uh, you know, from you know, that, that, that squatted position comes from your brain, right? You have to have some sort of like central command going out to your muscles, telling the muscles to contract. The ability of force or the, the amount of force that we can generate by signaling from our brain to our muscles is less than the amount of force that we can generate if we directly stimulate the muscle with like an external source. Um, so you know, take an electrode, you shock a muscle, you can produce more force in that muscle than what you're brain can voluntarily produce. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. So part of what we're interested in looking at is kind of what creates that deficit? Why is there a difference between our voluntary uh, contraction and our actual contractile capacity? Um, and that's really the easiest way to simplify it. Mm -hmm. But the, uh, the things we've done in the past, um, so I was involved in some research projects looking at like, uh, basically fast motor learning. So it's what we call like uh, the early stages of like skill acquisition during practice. Um, you know, one of those tasks was throwing darts at a dartboard with your uh, non-dominant hand mm -hmm. and looking at uh, kind of the degree of improvement that can be achieved um, over the course of like a 20 minute practice session. Um, and we were using something called transcranial direct current stimulation or PDCS 
it's kind of a, a short term to either inhibit or uh, excite the motor cortex uh, to increase the uh, rate of learning or decrease the rate of learning. Um, and so basically, the, the premise is that by making that uh, making that cortex more excitable, um, you could potentially facilitate a more rapid uh, assimilation of that skill. Or if you inhibit it, you can slow the rate of assimilation of that skill. And so that's kind of some of the stuff we've done in the past. Um, I think the direction, and we're still like in the early stages of planning for this, but the direction we're looking at going um, in the future is maybe how can we uh, either increase or decrease excitability uh, either in cortex or in cerebellum or some local structure to uh, increase your maximum voluntary contractile force production, or maybe even how fatigue might factor into uh, that limitation force output. So uh, okay. uh, personally, yeah, from a, from a personal standpoint, the um, thing that I'm most interested in actually is like brain computer interface technology. Mm -hmm. um, so <clears throat> the, the probably most popular uh, example of this uh, I can give is like uh, Elon Musk with Neuralink. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly yeah. what came to mind. Right, right. That's kind of what everyone thinks about. Um, there are other technologies that center around this and that. Neuralink is really, really cool. I'm super excited to see where that goes, but I think it's a while still probably become, before it becomes uh, commercially viable or uh, really even super functional, but I do think we'll see some cool things coming out of that in the next probably 10, 20 years. Um, but personally, I've got a, a bit of an interest in that area of research as well. I'd be, I always always tell uh, my mentor that my goal or objective like in life is to become like a cyborg or a, a robot, right? So if I can you know, upgrade to a, a cybernetic body at any point, I will be 100% on board and just upload my consciousness and go. Uh, <laughs> You know, that's uh, obviously a bit far-fetched, probably. So. so by 2030, we're going to see Davin hit a 1,200-pound raw squat due to some implant that tricks his mind into being able to handle insane loads. By 2040, we're just going to see full-on Terminator Davin. Right, see, and that's the thing. Like, if I could just go straight Terminator mode, like, there's really no limit to how much I could squat. It's just the <laughs> yeah. larger, larger, uh, you know, I don't know, larger, um, some sort of like shocks and compression system produce more force, right? So ultimately, yeah, to do a bulldozer, lift it all. <laughs> yeah, that'll be that'll be very interesting. I'm I'm just imagining some, you know, like some study design of uh, of what you could do and. I just feel like at the end of the day, there'll be a lot of ma mice sacrificed to the cause. So I'll be, I'll be yeah. on the lookout. Well, we'll see. Uh, we, we do most of our research as human research. It's actually, okay. uh, so probably not sacrificing any mice anytime soon, but we'll see. You never know. Um, I got the, uh, yeah. So like really the functional implication for something like this would be like, um, looking at people with like spinal cord injury, uh, or you know with uh you know maybe a loss of like a limb or an appendage or something uh so i personally think like uh prosthetics are really cool like so having some sort of like uh neural control of a prosthetic limb so being able to kind of like voluntarily yeah. mentally control like a robotic arm in the same way you would your normal arm yeah would be cool and there's definitely uh some evidence that that's something we could achieve at some point. Uh, and there are some, some prototypes and some early um, applications of that already that exist, but it's still a ways off before it's ever, you know, a, a seamless uh, replacement. Mm -hmm. But I think that, you know, that's where we'd see the most like functional implications, even if it's just like looking at, uh, you know, taking someone with like, uh, you know, a higher spinal cord injury and like, uh, who has like limited use or no use of their extremities, we could see someone like that maybe regaining control of like, say, uh, like a 
some sort of exoskeleton or uh, a, a wheelchair, you know, that they can, you know, a power wheelchair they can control just by thinking. Yeah. Um, things like that, I think, are probably more like frontline things that we'll see um, and probably things that we're most likely to see within our lifetimes versus, you know, actually seeing, uh, you know, the human body replaceable with a, with a robot. But yeah, it's kind of fun thinking anyway. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like there's definitely an area to make just a positive impact on on mankind there. Hopefully a lot of funding as well, because especially like with the prosthetics, that could be a very, very valuable thing for everyone. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, definitely. So I feel like we have a we have a good sense of of your goals, whether it be impacting the up and coming um, you know, trainers in the fitness community, uh, helping make groundbreaking scientific discoveries in, in that context. What are some of your, uh, your goals in the gym? And I know recently we've talked that like your training has, has changed drastically just because of COVID. But um, what yeah. is that for you these days? So, uh, well, my wife and I recently acquired uh, some equipment for our garage, which is cool. So we've actually got uh, about 500 pounds of weights. Uh, nice. uh, got a half rack and some, some TRX and stuff like that. So we've got pretty much everything we need to work out at home. Uh, oh. You know, minus a few like specialty pieces of equipment, which would be nice. But we uh, we're mostly been training here. And it's uh, it's going well. Uh, I really I don't entirely miss the social component of going into the gym because again I'm not an overly social person. So it works out uh, kind of for the better and it allows a little bit more flexibility in training. Um, one thing I've noticed, um, I'm sure this is going on over there, but like the, the post COVID gym scene is, is such that like gyms are closing earlier than they used to or having more limited hours, uh, maybe opening later, uh, which is just making it a little bit harder because we were still trying to go to NIFS or uh, train at you know, the other gym in the city barbell. Um, but uh, you know, the FC would close at like eight o'clock, and uh, you know, the city barbell would be like super busy, and you know, with COVID and everything, just trying to limit exposure. Mm -hmm. um, that's obviously not ideal. So um, yeah, I would just decide to just get some home equipment. And yeah. The coolest thing, man, is that we can just play music. We can play whatever we want to play, <laughs> uh, whatever volume we want to play it, and it's it's not a big deal. Right. So that's cool. Um, training in general, though. Um, Mainly, I'm just trying to kind of maintain strength as best I can throughout uh, grad school. Uh, motivation to like really compete and uh, do super well. It's kind of on the back burner right now just because uh, it's either I, I, I'm a very extreme type of person with things I get into. I either go 100% into one thing or not at all. And mm -hmm. so right now I'm trying my best to manage going, you know, 50 50 i guess right so like not giving everything i've got to the gym but also uh not giving it all up because if i try and go really hard that's hard for me to focus on other things um so yeah just trying to kind of keep my totals uh I mean, i've lost a fair amount of strength over the last several months just because i haven't been training as much and honestly i've been playing more video games than i should uh, which is you know not conducive to getting swole but whatever uh the uh objective is to kind of you know maybe i would like to see myself hit like a four plus bench press at some point um, i mean i've hit a 600 pound squat i've hit a 600 pound deadlift um it'd be cool at some point to get those numbers again and, and go above them but uh, near future i don't have any plans to compete or anything so uh we'll see um yeah. i'll just kind of keep those numbers in the back of my head as kind of like my ideal uh training range but i'm also not really willing to sacrifice uh excessive amounts of like other time for it so right. you get what you get out of the limited input that you put definitely right? so yeah, yeah. There's seasons for everything so if you do ever uh want to come back to it i'm sure without a doubt you'd have success in uh in yeah. putting together like a total or whatever you want to do hey maybe you come out of retirement and hit an npc show who knows? <laughs> you know, it's funny you say that. I, uh, I told my wife that uh, after I finished grad school, I might potentially consider doing another bodybuilding contest just for just for the sake of it. It's uh, 
she's not overly thrilled by that idea because <laughs> contest prepping is a pain in the ass and it's not uh, i'm not a pleasant person while i'm contest prepping so <laughs> but you know i definitely feel we'll that. See. Yeah. yeah well Davin, I really appreciate uh, some of the advice you've been able to offer in this episode. And just overall, I feel like your sentiments are very uh, well put and, and it offers like a unique perspective that I think people should hear. I want to close real quick with two of the things that it's been what, two years since I did that internship and they're still sticking with me. Um, yeah. I don't know. I feel like we've talked about this, but one thing that I, has always stuck with me was uh, I had a friend who came to work out with me at NIFS once, a friend from Ohio. And he's like, you know, very successful bodybuilder, jacked. And he was doing this training method. And it, there's an acronym to it. I can't remember. I want to say it's like FST or something where you hit like very high volume and then you stretch and you hold that. Does that sound familiar? Yeah, FST7. Yeah. Uh, gosh, what's his name? Uh, I can't remember his name. The guy who... I think it was Charles Glass who made that popular. Okay. But yeah, I think I remember. Yeah. Right. And so we had a conversation and I was like, what are your thoughts? And you told me kind of like some of the physiology and science behind it. I was like, huh? Okay. Like, Hey, I guess if it works for him, like whatever. And you were like, well, actually it's, it's okay to question things. And you know, one person might find results, but for the masses, it's best to assume that kind of science mindset. And, and really explore things and see if they're effective, and, you know, see their valid, validity. And that's something that I've always carried with me. I feel like it was a, it was a great piece of advice. So I appreciate that, man. It's cool, man. I'm glad I could uh, impart that on you. Right. That's uh, something I think is really important, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's, I would even say the skepticism is, I think, the most important thing. Yeah. You know, just having, having a, some base level of skepticism about everything. And it just goes for pretty much all walks of life. You just question everything because otherwise, if you don't do that, you're inevitably just going to take something uh, at face value and that thing may be wrong, right? Exactly. So, nothing wrong with being uh, inquisitive. Mm -hmm. And then I feel like there's definitely going to be similar people right now that were in the situation that I was in. So that was after my junior year of school. I had, uh, for some reason, the way... Ohio State set up their curriculum. I basically had like only general education and hard science classes. I had very, very limited exposure to the fun stuff, like the exercise physiology, the, the nutrition for performance, you know, stuff that I really enjoyed. And at that point, I was kind of jaded because I felt like, you know, we were doing all this, but why? And, and they wanted, right. they were at the time recommending like, hey, start looking into grad schools, you know, higher academia. And so at the time, I was like, I feel like this is kind of a scam, you know, why am I doing all this just for them to say, Hey, pay money to go do the next thing. But, uh, but just like being able to learn from you, someone who was like actually kind of about the life, you know, you lifted, you had had a real experience in, in weights and, you know, nutrition for competitions. I found that really refreshing. And uh, for anyone else that kind of had that mindset that I did, I think there's light at the end of the tunnel and there are definitely practitioners in academia, but regardless, you'll learn and you'll become better from it um, if you do decide yeah. to go that route. Yeah, that, you know, that makes me think. Um, I was at an ACSM conference a couple years ago, uh, and there were several speakers there uh, who are, if you're not familiar, ACSM is American College of Sports Medicine, uh, just for the, the listeners. We're kind of at one of the uh, leading sources on nutrition, or not nutrition, but um, health and fitness guidelines for the, uh, you know, the world, but U.S. as well. But anyhow, they were holding a conference, um, and several of the speakers there were actually uh, talking about the importance of resistance training and exercise and, like, long-term uh, like health and longevity, which is kind of crazy because uh, for the longest time, the entire spotlight has always been on aerobic training or cardiovascular training, mm -hmm. um, which is something I'm sure you experienced in your uh, undergrad. There's just so, 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 so much emphasis on like aerobic training. And I don't want to, for a second, 
make it seem like aerobic training is important because it is. Um, personally, I don't really do much of it because I just am not particularly enthused by it. Um, and you know, I know I'm not alone in saying that. There are a lot of people like us who are just way more into weightlifting and we're more likely to do that. And I think the kind of the, the takeaway that they were really trying to get across is that you know, we need to give more uh, credence to resistance training and, and weightlifters and, and people who do that because just trying to shame people for only doing, you know, resistance training and say, well, you know, you should do more cardio to every single person who's like, well, I, I lift weights. That's not really doing any good for, for the, the population as a whole because these people are still doing something that's good for their health, right? By and large, right? I mean, they're exercising, they're they're getting active and they're still improving their health dramatically compared to the alternative, which is not exercising. And if at the end of the day, someone will either lift weights or do nothing at all, lifting weights is way better than doing nothing at all. Way, way better. And I think like, as people are kind of drawn to that naturally, we find in the academic circles, uh, there just aren't very many of us that are like big into lifting weights. Everyone's all about cardio this, cardio that, you know. And I think we, we need to like, it's like you said, we're out there, we exist. We just need to better like uh, represent ourselves and be more like joined. But uh, it's, a, it's certainly growing. It's a growing field, it's growing interest. And I think in the next 10, 20 years, we'll see more uh, just evidence and research coming out, putting kind of resistance training on the same like uh, level in terms of importance is aerobic training. So yeah, I'll just kind of add to that a bit, but yeah. So. Mm -hmm. Well, Davin, I feel like I myself learned a lot. Um, and just that, like I said, fresh perspective, it's always good to talk to you, man. Uh, so I really yeah, appreciate likewise, man. Yeah. I really appreciate you taking time. Uh, thank you all for listening to episode 21 with Davin Greenwell. Um, and Devin, best of luck in the, the future endeavors as you yeah, likewise. Thank you. Thank you. All righty. We will catch you in the next episode. Thanks again for listening, guys.